So good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to um, welcome you all for the 2018 series of my um, question lectures on, um, on the universe um, as viewed by um, astronomers and physicists. Anyway, um, today I'm going to tell you about a view of the universe that um, is not accessible to the human eye. Um, it's the universe as viewed um, at high energies um, with x-rays, for example. Um, x-rays are pretty dangerous things. Um, and fortunately, the atmosphere shields us from cosmic x-rays. But if you go up high enough in space, for example, with telescopes, you see the universe glowing in x-rays. And it's a, a wonderful thing, as I'll show you. Uh, many of the phenomena we see with um, ordinary telescopes look totally different in the high energy uh, range. And it's not just x-rays. There are more energetic um, photons of light, gamma rays. Um, those are even more dangerous than x-rays um, because they're produced, uh, for example, in thermonuclear explosions. Again, the atmosphere shields us very, very nicely, although um, we can somehow avoid that if we get too close to one of the Earth, of course. But anyway, for astronomy, it's a wonderful thing, too, to see explosions in the universe, as I'll show you. And then there are cosmic rays and um, weird particles called neutrinos. Um, um, discovered um, less than a century ago, and um, they're definitely a phenomenon of the, of the universe that tells us about very, very uh, bizarre things out there. So let me begin. Um, so this is um, an, an X-ray telescope, still in orbit, still taking data after um, um, nearly 20 years now. Uh, and um, it basically images the universe in X-radiation with the same precision as our best optical telescopes. So you'll see amazing images of nebulae and x-rays um, that look nothing like the optical ones that I'll show you. And x-rays, of course, come from some very hot, hot gas, hot plasma, unlike the, um, the more normal stuff, um, the, the cooler stars that we see with ordinary telescopes. Um, and then um, here's a gamma ray telescope. Um, gamma rays are much harder to focus than, than x-rays. so. Um, we don't get nearly as exquisite resolution, but nevertheless, the universe is, um, is glowing in gamma rays. Um, our Milky Way is in particular, and I'll show you some of those images in a moment. And so this telescope is, um, um, was launched nearly 10 years ago, it's still taking data, still very active, um, and um, it's um, 7,000 kilometers um, um, above the Earth in, in orbit. Okay. Um, now, if the gamma rays are high enough energy, um, they can actually, um, in the atmosphere, the atmosphere, they produce um, showers of particles which um, emit light and can be seen on the ground by telescopes. So here's an example of a terrestrial gamma ray telescope. It doesn't look at gamma rays directly, but their indirect impact on the atmosphere. And um, so this indirect impact results in tiny flashes of light from the air shower, from the cosmic ray um, interaction of gamma rays with the Earth's atmosphere. And um, so these are rather crude telescopes by the, the way we design telescopes, but designed to capture these tiny flashes of light from the sky, um, which uh, are, are caused by a hundred gamma ray. And this particular telescope or series of telescopes is uh, to high sight in um, Namibia. Um, which is um, particularly clear skies and um, uh, is, is, a, is a good sight to study the southern part of the, the, uh, of, of the sky where one can see much more of the Milky Way than from the north, actually, the center of the galaxy in particular. So the southern hemisphere is a good place to be. Okay, that's a gamma ray telescope. And then um, if you want to go to really high energy gamma rays, you have to do something a little bit more dramatic. And this means going to a very high mountain site. Um, where it's very flat and where the air is very clear. And this particular one um, is in Mexico, in the um, in, in mountains, um, Sierra ne Negra Mountains, that are some 4,000 4 kilometers high. And um, it consists of um, a, a series of, um, of vats of um, ultra-purified water that, again, are designed to capture some of the debris called muons from the air showers produced by the gamma rays. And again, it has to be spread over a large area because this air shower disperses over a large area. Um, okay, so um, 
That was a, a brief survey of our telescopes. I'll come to more in a second. But let me tell you about the neutrino uh, first and how that um, we, is a messenger from space. It was discovered um, uh, in um, 1956, um, and um, they, um, it was predicted because in particle interactions, um, you know, energy is a fundamental thing that's conserved when one particle bashes into another, but they, they found there was some slight mismatch that things weren't being quite accounted for. And so um, it was Pauli originally, Wolfgang Pauli, that postulated a mysterious particle which had essentially no mass but carried off energy and also spin. Um, and he called that, um, um, I guess the Italian word was the little neutron, but it turned out to be a new type of particle, the neutrino, which carries off energy and um, with, with almost no mass. Um, and so it was discovered um, in, um, uh, by... Um, Spe special experiments, and, 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 and finally uh, it was um, observed in, in a bubble chamber, basically, uh, which is um, uh, full of hydrogen, and, and the, the event um, of a neutrino rarely striking uh, protons will actually transfer some energy, and um, this makes sort of bubbles in the hydrogen that can be detected. Okay, so, so that, was the, that was the discovery in 1970, and um, it was realized that whenever there were nuclear reactions, one should make neutrinos, and they, they, they could be very high energy. Um, they're, in fact, made by, um, um, by in explosions in the distant universe. And in the sun, neutrinos are produced in nuclear reactions. The nuclear reactions that power the center of the sun um, give new neutrinos. In fact, they're the only things that escape directly from the middle of the sun. And so if you want to prove, really understand, what goes on in the middle of the sun, which you can never have access to, you have to build a neutrino detector, a neutrino telescope, actually. And then you can, um, uh, and I'll show you how it essentially can give you an image of the sun in neutrinos in, in, in principle, okay, although it, because neutrinos are so rare and interact so weakly, of course they can pass right through the sun. I mean, it's very hard to, to get enough of these events to make a real image, but we can certainly det detect them. And so here is um, the, one of the large, largest neutrino uh, experiments, neutrino telescopes in the world. It um, uh, uh, consists of, it's under a, um, a mountain, um, in a mine actually, um, and you have to go very deep because you want to avoid cosmic rays, which are contaminants. You want to look for these elusive particles, neutrinos, which will interact in the water, in highly purified water. Um, they scatter off the electrons and um, and um, that you get slight amounts of energy being released, which can be seen as um, flashes of light from passage of neutrinos. And so in this particular experiment, there were many thousands of, um, of phototubes, um, and there were some 50,000 gallons of purified water, and um, th this was all um, designed um, in the dark to look for occasional light flashes. I'll show you a, a result from this experiment. And here you have the, the engineers checking the, the, the different photomultipliers. Um, there was um, an accident in, in, this, in this system um, uh, about 15 years ago where a photomultiplier exploded and led to a whole cascade of explosions. And almost the whole experiment was destroyed. But they've rebuilt it since, and it's now act, acting uh, very, very well. And um, so it's, I've not actually been there to, to see this, but it is, it is an amazing sight when you see this experiment. And so a well-known photographer, Andreas Gursky, took this amazing image. So Gursky specializes in massive, massive images. Um, uh, and he, he was there to take this of all of these are the individual photomultipliers, some 10,000 10, of them or more. Um, and here you see the, the, um, the, the boat with the uh, world of size of an engineer there. Um, okay. So, um, what have they seen? Okay, so here's an event. Um, when one of these um, uh, neutrinos does produce a high energy electron, then that cascades into other particles in the water, and you get, um, and the coloring represents different energies, and you, can, and you get some, some image, and this lasts a, a, a microsecond or less, a nanosecond even, but your detectors can pick this up. And so this is one event of a very high energy neutrino hitting, um, cascading in the water. Okay, um, 
And um, these things happen rarely because neutrinos don't interact that, that much with ordinary matter. But, you know, you, you, you stay looking for, for days, for weeks, for months, and then you pick up, you pick up events. Okay, um, so that's a neutrino experiment designed to look for neutrinos basically from the sun, um, that sort of energy range. So it turns out that um, there are neutrinos that out there, we think, from um, really violent explosions of the universe, not just things like the sun, but stars collapsing, making black holes, that are much more energetic. So you need a much more dramatic type of experiment. So here is the largest neutrino telescope in the world. Um, it's been um, now, construction began about um, seven years ago or so, and it's now been running for a while. And it's at the South Pole. And so it's very close to the Amundsen Scott um, station. And um, what they do in this experiment is, they, again, they have phototubes, but they drill down in the ice um, to three kilometers down. And they have strings of phototubes. And at this depth, it's totally dark, but the ice is totally transparent. So you can see, essentially, hundreds of meters or even kilometers. And you can look for these rare flashes of neutrinos, which in this case, um, interact with the Earth um, and produce particles called muons, which interact with the water and give you light flashes too. So that, that is the, um, the, the idea. And this is a drill uh, being set up to lower these tubes of phototubes, um, the, these strings of phototubes. And this is a schematic of, of the experiment. And so here is the, um, the top of the ice at the, at the South Pole. And they lower many strings. To drill in ice, you have to have a high, you basically you steam drill. Hot, 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 very hot water is the way one, one, one drills. And you then make the hole in the ice and lower the, photo, the strings of phototubes three kilometers. This is the scale of the Eiffel Tower, for example. Quite amazing. And, and each of these is 50 or 100 meters separated, and some are more closely packed together, but designed basically to look for signals of particles interacting with the ice. Now, Lots of neutrinos are made inside the Earth's atmosphere by cosmic rays hitting the Earth's atmosphere. So it's the neutrinos, however, that don't go through the atmosphere, not made there, but the ones that are produced in the universe that you want to look for. And the way you do that is you use the Earth as your detector, and that filters out. The atmospheric neutrinos won't go through the Earth, but what will happen is neutrinos will hit the Earth, produce muons in the Earth, which then go through this detector. So you look for upward coming events. And I'll show you what that looks like in a second. So here's an example of this. Um, so here's um, lo looking down something coming from below the Earth, a muon. And because you can see it's, it interacts, it's coming in some direction, and, and, and there's a, a delay. Uh, you know, it hits this this string first of, of, of cameras and, and later this one. And so you, see, you get patterns which give you directionality. So you can figure out by triangulation basically where the signal is coming from. So it's a truly amazing experiment. And these are the sort of signals they get. So you have to imagine now, here's the drilling station and, uh, and where all the signals are correlated. And now you're you know, three kilometers below the ice level and you're looking for flashes uh, like this. And these now are going to be neutrinos that are um, many thousands of times more energetic than the ones from the sun. These are truly interesting neutrinos because they come from very weird events in the universe. We believe they should be there because we see very energetic particles. I'll show you examples in a moment of what we call cosmic rays. And, but to see them, because the particles or the events are rare and they interact so weakly to these neutrinos, you need to basically, in this case, survey a cubic kilometer of ice um, a trillion tons of ice and um, look for these rare signals. So you have to be patient, but they are collecting events. And so here are all the events that they've found up till recently. There aren't that many. There are 40 or 50 of them. And they come from all around the sky. And we don't know their origin. We believe it's something involving massive black holes. I'll show you examples of their explosions in a moment. Um, they produce energetic particles and neutrinos, among other things. And they are, uh, some of them hit the Earth. And lo and behold, we see these signals. So we're, we're, we're finding, and this is the Milky Way, the plane of the Milky Way in this projection. And you can see that the events come from all over the sky, meaning they probably come not just from our galaxy, but very far away indeed. Um, events that are much more energetic than anything in the middle of the sun. Um, amazing events from high energy phenomena that we are just beginning to understand. So the future will tell us as we get more and more data, 
we'll be, and improve our positioning, we'll be able to figure out where these things are coming from. So far, the numbers are too small. We just have literally a handful of events or several, several handfuls of events. That's not enough to get a uh, positioning accuracy. So that will come. That's the future. Okay. Um, so one um, particle that is responsible for the neutrinos is called the cosmic ray. So cosmic rays are high-energy particles that um, bombard the Earth. They're produced in space and exploding stars, um, among other things. Um, and um, we are, they're actually quite dangerous in some sense um, because cosmic rays can, you know, or gamma rays, but comets can penetrate, you know, human tissue and, and um, give mutations and things. So one doesn't want to be too exposed to cosmic rays. Again, the Earth's atmosphere protects us. Um, if you're at high altitude, you're a little bit less protected. Um, no one really knows uh, whether there are more mutations from cosmic ray events, if you live at high altitude or not. The data just isn't good enough to really say. But we think the Earth's atmosphere is a pretty good, pretty good blanket for that. So it makes you worry, actually, in the future, when we start sending our astronauts to Mars, for example, take them you know, half a year to get there, they will be exposed to a lot of cosmic rays on that journey. And uh, we don't really know um, what that will do for them. Okay, that's uh, an interesting question. Um, for, the, for the space station, that's not a problem. That's surrounded by enough atmosphere to block out most of the cosmic rays. Well, but it's the more adventurous journeys in the future that wants to worry about. Anyway, cosmic rays were discovered in 1911 by um, Victor Hess, okay, a physicist. Um, and these were his helpers. And he took photographic plates up in a balloon, um, um, stacks of emulsion, and noticed that they were... Um, uh, basically, there were signals basically giving, um, there, was no, there was no exposure to light, they were kept in the dark, but when he returned to ground, he found that there were signals in that emulsion, um, traces of particle energy release, part expo exposed blobs, which he realized were due to particles of high energy. This was the discovery of cosmic rays. Okay, so he found the first cosmic rays, um, energy particles in space. Since then, um, it's been an amazing adventure. Um, and um, so here is um, a cosmic, the world's largest cosmic ray telescope. Again, they come from space. We built telescopes to try to figure out where they come from. And so this telescope, um, again, it involves um, uh, purified water in a tank. Um, but in this case, it's spread over some enormous area um, in the Pampas in Argentina, where there's a lot of space to, to do this, and the sky is clear. And the reason is these air showers that you produce spread the debris over a very large air shower. Here's an example of what I mean by an air shower. You have a highly cosmic ray in the atmosphere, and then it makes particles, which then make other particles by colliding with atoms. And all this debris is spread over many, many kilometers. And the more energetic the, the particle that's coming in, the, the larger this area that you have to monitor. So what you do is you try, you have all these tanks of purified water with electronics involved, and you try then to, um, to, to look for a coordinated signal, OK? And that's the way you look for what we call an air shower and figure out that what caused it was an energetic cosmic ray or a gamma ray, depending on the, the, the type of event that you see. So this, in principle, this can get both gamma rays and cosmic rays. This particular observatory was designed to look for the cosmic rays. Now, just to give you some idea of why you need to have such a big telescope, the typical rate you produce for every square kilometer is one event per century, OK? Therefore, you need many hundreds of kilometers, thousands, in fact, to do this experiment which, hence, um, uh, the largest observatory to date is, um, is um, in this region of Argentina. There's one parallel ones are being built, built in the north, but um, this is the largest so far. So um, here is what we've found. Um, so this is the distribution of cosmic rays of all energies, starting from uh, the lowest to the very highest. Now, so this is a measure of energy. Um, and let me give you some feeling for what this means. These are particles from space, the numbers of particles from space hitting the Earth. Um, and if you go to the largest particle colliders that we have on the Earth, um, one of them um, is in Chicago, Fermilab. Uh, that's the second largest. The largest, most powerful one is in Geneva, the Large Hadron Collider. You ask when you collide particles together, how energetic can you make them in that collision? And by bombarding particles together and letting them break up, you study particle physics. You learn what the matter is in the universe, right? Okay, so the limit to what we can do 
with the biggest collider we have at CERN at the moment is roughly over here, okay? And each of these are factors of 10. So the cosmic rays explore the energy of the universe by many, many more factors of 10 than we can do from the Earth. It's a wonderful natural resource that can tell us, once we study these events, what matter ultimately is made of. Because only by bombarding particles together can you understand you know, the, that it's made of quarks and then what the quarks are made of, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you just need more and more energy to destroy these things and look at what's inside, essentially. Anyway, so the cosmic rays are wonderful for that. In fact, the particle called the muon was first discovered in the cosmic rays long before it was found in colliders. And the reason was is that particles like the muon live such a short time that there are none present naturally on the Earth. Okay? You're, but when you make collisions, you can make them, of course, in a, a collider. But before they made these really big colliders, we discovered muons and cosmic rays. Why? Because of the wonderful effect, predicted by Einstein, of, of the slowing down of time, time dilatation. Okay, so in, because these cosmic rays are moving so fast, time slows down for them. So the muon, which should have decayed in a tiny fraction of a second up in space, makes it down to Earth and was discovered by people like Victor Hess and so forth and the people that followed him in doing cosmic ray experiments on the Earth, actually. Okay, so that's what we can learn from cosmic rays. It's really the frontier of what matter is made of. But, and, and what is also really interesting is that these really energetic cosmic rays must come from very far away. They're so energetic that, um, you know, that and they've, they've gone so far that they surely came from other galaxies, not from our own galaxy. So m many of these come from our galaxy, but those energetic ones come from extragalactic space, from the universe, in fact. So it's a wonderful resource, and we're just, again, beginning to um, understand, for the most energetic ones, how many there are and where they might come from, but we still haven't figured out exactly what their origin is yet. Okay. Um, right, so now let me... Um, having That's what I want to say for the moment about this panorama of high energy photons and particles. Uh, let's now turn to some of the sources. What makes them? And so maybe the most interesting source, um, the, 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 which we know really does accelerate particles we're, because we've studied so, so many of these exploding stars, is a supernova. Okay, and this is the way a supernova works. Um, you have a star. Um, this is a star that's I mean, the sun is just beginning to turn its hydrogen to helium, so it's not really very advanced, and it, it's ne probably never going to really explode, actually, in its future. It'll have a more quiescent death. But a massive star burns up its nuclear fuel very rapidly. So first it turns hydrogen to helium, the same principle as the nuclear bomb, to make energy. And then when it's exhausted the hydrogen in the center, it can burn the helium because it's got enough gravity to heat up the hydrogen, the helium, and then make it burn with itself and give you carbon. And, th and this goes on. So eventually, as this, there's enough gravity in this star to keep on heating up the interior as it runs out of nuclear fuel to burn more and more of the heavier elements. So eventually, uh, just before it, it's, it's, it's got a, a core of iron, which is... From iron, you can't do anything. Iron is the ultimate slag heap of the universe. You can't get any energy out of iron. Um, but you have layers of oxygen, nitrogen, and then the helium that you began with and bits of hydrogen on the outside. So then the star explodes. Okay? And all of this debris is dispersed um, into the clouds, into the interstellar clouds in the galaxy. And our solar system condensed out of this. And um, here we are, right? We have carbon in our bodies and uh, we breathe oxygen. There was once in the ashes of an exploding star. So that is something that we, um, we basically have proven, really, by studying the composition of, of gas around us. We can, we can watch all this dis process of, of dispersal of, of, of these debris. OK, so and then we can now look for the after effects of this explosion. And we call this the remnant of uh, a supernova, which is the name for this exploding star. And the most famous one was observed um, in 1054 AD by Chinese astronomers. Um, I don't think um, that was somewhat of the Dark Ages in Europe, so uh, you know, we have no records of anything like that. But the Chinese kept very careful astrological re records. And then in, so in 1054 AD, they noticed a star that appeared out of nothing. And um, it coincides exactly with what we now observe with modern telescopes. And this is a combination of radio telescopes, infrared, optical, and X-ray telescopes, the Crab Nebula. 
And right in the center of the Crab Nebula, there is a star, which um, I think is over here. I'll show you a close up in a second, which is the remnant, the compact remnant of the explosion. Um, so what is left behind is what we call a neutron star, um, which is still glowing, okay, and, um, um, and spinning rapidly and pulsing, in fact, and we see radio waves from that and other things too. And so that is um, uh, a beautiful example of the remnant of a supernova um, uh, some thousand years ago, uh, 900 years ago. So what we um, have learned from studying these around the Milky Way, our galaxy, is that there should be on the average one every century of these wonderful exploding stars. Um, uh, now that one a century, you know, is a number with big uncertainties, but anyway, let me tell you, I'll show you the one or two I've seen since. Um, but just to go back to this neutron star, imagine the mass of the sun, which is, you know, a million kilometers across, compressed inside roughly uh, an area of the city of London, okay? Um, 10 kilometers or whatever, okay? And this thing, because it compresses, is rapidly spinning. Uh, also, it had magnetic fields, or stars do, and as they compress, they got very strong as well by the compression. And so it's spinning rapidly and emitting radio waves, and it's, it's like a beacon, um, and as it spins around, if, if it's not pointing exactly at us, you see flashes, right, as the, as the beacon goes, just like with a, with a lighthouse. Um, and we call those pulsars, radio pulsars. And the amazing thing is, again, um, it's the early days of discovery of radio emission, and the crab is a great example. We've followed this up with X-rays and gamma rays, and there we see this, these neutron stars pulsing in, in just about everything. Okay, so here's an X-ray image, a close-up of the crab. And you can see now, um, here we are, um, the, 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 you can see the effect of the, 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 the spinning pulsar ejecting particles, beaming particles, including cosmic rays, um, and no doubt neutrinos, and many things, or gamma rays, all sorts of things, um, and, um, and beaming them. Um, and um, the, the, the Earth, uh, this beam will occasionally you know, intersect with the line of sight to the Earth, and we'll see that. And so this, again, is, a, is an image of the, of the entire nebula, and this is a close-up from the very center. Okay, so we can really uh, see this, this, um, th this compressed remnant of a star, of a massive star at work there. And if you ask, you know, let's try to say roughly how much energy comes out in, um, in this compact star, so th 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 this diagram just shows you the total energy from the entire remnant, and this is the energy from this. It, it's, there's a lot of energy from this compact thing we call the pulsar. Um, and um, in the radio, you, you see this thing is pulsing, you know, tens of times a second. And, um, um, and all, all, all this black stuff is pulsing. And this is the, the total radiation from the, from the remnant. So, so it's a very, very energetic phenomenon um, because everything has got so concentrated. And you also see the, 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 the remnant, the nebula around it, which is the relic of the explosion. Okay, um, so that's the crab. Um, now, when we look around the Milky Way, we see um, other remnants. And so they're very beautiful objects, actually, as when imaged with space telescopes or with large ground-based telescopes. And um, these are two of the most famous ones. And these are explosions that occurred roughly 10,000 years ago. Okay, so no one was there to witness these, as far as we know. Um, but the, we can date the, these roughly by the rate at which the nebulosity is expanding. Okay, and so this, we think, these two correspond to an explosion roughly 10,000, one in the southern hemisphere in the constellation of Vela, one in the north in, in the constellation of Cygnus. Um, and, uh, and you see these, uh, the blue is glowing in x-rays, the, the red and the green is glowing in, um, in, in optical, and this, uh, the, the, this red is also in uh, optical light, okay, mostly. So that, that's what's left, and of course we can't date these so precisely, and there are no records to compare with, but th this is how we try to figure out how frequently these things occur. Okay, so this was the last supernova that any human being observed, okay, when, when the explosion occurred. Tycho Brahe, named, it's called Tycho Supernova, 15, 1572, he saw a star appear out of nothing, and with modern observations, much later, um, 400 years later, we've now made X-ray and optical maps, and so here you can see the X-ray glow from this expanding shock into the interstellar medium, which is where these cosmic rays are being produced, and then in the interior, this, um, 
huge conglomerate of, of nebulosity. Okay, so that was 1572. And let's say on the average, there should be one supernova every year. So there's one other supernova um, in Cassiopeia. It happened around 1700. The amazing thing is nobody reported it. Now, 1700, you think there'd be lots of astronomers, you know, or, or astrologers or whatever, staring at the sky, but there is no record that anyone's found of a supernova since uh, the end of the 16th century. Okay, so this one we think we date from the expansion to be around 1700, but that was you know a long time ago, more than 300 years ago. So we are we think on the average these should occur every century. So we're overdue for an exploding star in the Milky Way, and it should be a truly spectacular star. It should. Um, on the course of you know a few nights, be brighter than Venus. Okay, you you couldn't possibly miss it if it, if when this occurs. Well, we don't know why people. Maybe the the one Cassiopeia was maybe the weather was bad that at that time or something. Who knows? But um, anyway, so that that's something to um, to think about for the future. Okay, so let me move on to um, a different scale of phenomenon, um, also producing. Um, very energetic particles and gamma rays and x-rays, the stuff I've showed you already that we can look at with our telescopes. And these are galaxies, and in particular, I want to focus on the very center of the galaxy where we believe that in nearly every case, there is a really massive black hole lurking there. Now, it's incredibly hard to um, prove this because a black hole, by definition, is black, it's, it's nothing. Um, so what you look for is the effect of... Um, of stuff you know, falling in onto the black hole, getting very hot from some very compact region, and you infer, um, if you see a lot of energy being produced in a very tiny space, that you know, a black hole is your best guess, and that's the, the origin of objects that we call quasars. Um, for galaxies, it's, it's a bit trickier, because um, here, uh, most of the time, uh, the black holes can be rather quiescent. I mean, they, um, this a vast explosion, something that maybe occurred when they formed or a long time ago, but now it's tricky. In our Milky Way, there's a black hole in the very middle, but it's you know totally passive, and we only are sure it's there because we can measure the speeds of stars in the very center, and so we can tell there's some incredibly large mass in, uh, in the very central region of the galaxy, which is not emitting any light, and therefore we infer it, it's almost certainly a black hole. But it's circumstantial evidence, but it's pretty strong. So let me now turn to more evidence from galaxies. Okay, so uh, f first, um, I want you just to appreciate how different galaxies look when you look at different parts of the spectrum. And I'm going to focus on moving to higher and higher energies. So here is um, a beautiful galaxy um, as seen um, in the um, optical and ultraviolet, um, Messier 51. So the um, there are lot, all this white stuff is many, many unresolved stars. These are the spiral arms of the galaxy, and these various knots that you see are regions of hot, young stars forming, uh, stars that are just millions of years old. And so when you look at this same galaxy um, in X-rays, look how different it is. Suddenly, in X-rays, you're sensitive to the really young stars because they're, they're so hot they emit an X-rays. And um, you, you're just picking out the youthful part of the galaxy, in essence, and that's concentrated in, in, these, in these spiral arms, which are compression regions, which make stars, and, and they just, uh, just, um, just are highlighted in the, to the, to the X-ray telescope, the X-ray vision. So things do look different. And it gets more extreme uh, as you go to higher energies. So let me go back to gamma rays. Um, I told you a bit about pulsars. So one of the big discoveries of the Fermi Gamma Ray Telescope was that our galaxy is full of um, pulsating sources. So um, here, this is the sky as measured by the Fermi Telescope. All this red stuff is glowing gamma rays from very um, many types of sources, including um, well, just cosmic rays hitting gas and giving you gamma rays. That's what we think is the major source. And, and also, um, there are pulsars. And each of these squares um, and these red spots, are basically, they're coming and going every few seconds. They're pulsating at you. So uh, the Fermi telescope couldn't miss this when it you know, ex exposed um, 
uh, for a while because the sources would just come and go. And they've discovered over, over five or more years of, of observing um, hundreds uh, of these um, neutron stars. They are basically very compact stars spinning and emitting beams of gamma rays at the Earth. And so because we're just seeing the ones that are pointed towards us, um, then we think there are many, many more than the ones we actually see. Um, corresponding to all the many stars that have died a long time ago but leave these compact um, uh, neutron stars behind them. So that is a discovery of the gamma rays. And um, so that was actually a discovery made about 10 years ago. But long before that, there was another discovery which was totally secret for a decade or more. And so this was, let's go back to the 1970s, the very first gamma ray telescope. So why were USA and Russia so interested in gamma-ray telescopes? Well, they knew, we knew, everybody knew that nuclear explosions emit gamma rays. We, we knew they emitted neutrinos, but this is before the days neutrino telescopes, but gamma-ray telescopes, they were, they were not complicated. And so in the 1970s, um, there, there was a period when there were a number of gamma-ray satellites being launched by the US military and by the Russian equivalents and the Russians actually got there first, in fact. Um, but, you know, rumors got around somehow, and then the US followed soon after. And they began reporting, they were looking for clandestine tests, okay, because that was the period when we were discussing, you know, non -proliferation, proliferation of nuclear weapons, et cetera, and talking about international test treaties. And so, how do you monitor nuclear tests? Well, you look for the gamma rays, you can't hide the gamma rays. And so the satellites would then look in, or, you know, scan the Earth, looking for, you know, maybe off South Africa was an explosion or something, whatever, and looking for, the, for these events, okay? And they found nothing at all from the Earth. The Russians were not secretly, you know, ex improving their nuclear uh, profile by developing new types of bombs. But what they did find were these explosions from space, okay? And they had no idea what was going on, okay, uh, for a decade or so, and it was all um, kept highly secret. But then eventually... Um, someone had the good sense to talk to the astronomers and eventually it beca became clear that these um, gamma ray bursts were really coming from, from very far away in the universe. And they were, again, basically um, neutron stars uh, being formed, okay? Um, and uh, we were suddenly um, discovering a whole new phenomenon. And so this is um, a recent map um, after six years of data from the Fermi satellite, gamma ray telescope, so m just discovering lots and lots of bursts. And so there are some m many thousands of these bursts now, this is the selection of them, and they come from all over the sky. And, and because they come all over the sky, this tells you they don't just come from the Milky Way, they don't come from anywhere near the Earth or near the Sun, they must come from the universe because they're everywhere you look, okay? Just like if you, you know, galaxies are everywhere, in the, everywhere you look not just in the Milky Way, like the stars are, et cetera. So that tells us that they really have a distant origin. And it turned out there were two types of um, gamma ray bursts, some which lasted a second or thereabouts, other which lasted tens of seconds. So they, 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 we call them the short and the long ones. And we think they're, they're, they're connected with different types of, of, of compact stars. In one case, um, uh, this is gotten a lot of excitement recently. It's two neutron stars, two compact stars, merging together. They're, they're in a binary system, and the, bi and the stars merge together. And that merger releases so much energy, you get a burst of gamma rays. And the reason this got a lot of excitement just a, a couple of months ago was that this same, the first um, gamma ray, the first gravitational wave detection from neutron stars um, coincided with a burst of gamma rays. And so we actually saw not just the two neutron stars merge together to give you gamma ray bursts, but at the same time, uh, a black hole formed from the two neutron stars merging together, which gave you this burst of gravity waves, which are seen by um, a, the, something called the, the LIGO telescope. Many of you may have read about it in the newspapers. That was a, got a lot of publicity. And then there are the, um, also the, the uh, so that's one type of gamma ray burst. We call those the longer duration ones. And then the very short duration gamma ray bursts are collapse of, single massive stars form black holes, and there's also a whole class of things. We, that, that's a speculation that that is their origin, but anyway, very compact objects being formed, black holes and neutron stars. Okay, um, so let's turn finally to something even more exotic. So, so far I've been discussing stars, basically, or the endpoints of massive stars. Let's now get back to the center of centers of galaxies 
and talk about very massive black holes and the early stages when they become, can become very, very visible and also be sources of cosmic rays and gamma rays, all these things that we're beginning to explore, and neutrinos of high energy. So here's um, uh, an image of uh, a galaxy which has a, a very active centre, and it's hard to see, but um, in this uh, region near the centre, this is the centre of a few hundred parsecs, um, there's a disk, and then in the centre of this disk there is a thought to be a black hole weighing millions of solar masses. So here's a, an example um, of another galaxy which shows this a bit more clearly. So again, this is a close-up of the central parts of this galaxy. And um, this is a, 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 a disk of gas which is being accreted by something in the center. We think it's a massive black hole. And so when you look in radio waves, you see this enormous explosion okay, coming from the center. This is the same scale as this picture. Okay? Um, and uh, this explosion is thought to be due to hot gas falling onto the black hole, acquiring lots of energy, and giving an explosion because it happens so quickly. And then if you zero in to the very center um, with an incredibly accurate system of radio waves, you can actually zoom in and, and again you see uh, evidence for stuff um, being ejected from the very center. So you can't see the black hole directly. Um, so why, why is all this happening? So what we think the physics of this is something like you wind up an elastic band and as you all know, if you then release it, you can suddenly hurt somebody or hurt your finger or something, right? You can release energy, basically. Okay, so the same idea as magnetic lines of force um, are a bit like, you can think of them analogously to, to, to elastic bands. They, 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 uh, they, they carry force and, and um, yeah, pressure. And if you wind them up, you basically build up that pressure and then let them go and suddenly you get... Um, uh, an eruption of energy, and it's channeled in a particular direction. Because if you imagine this magnetic field, you have this spinning black hole in the center, it just winds up and winds up, and then suddenly off it goes. And this is how you make what we call jets, jets of incredibly high energy, um, of hot plasma. And, this, and people try to do this in simulations, and this shows you um, uh, examples of simulations in one picture. Then we try to explain, here's the black hole. Um, which you can't see, and this is what you would expect to see if you had the exquisite resolution that you might get with a gravitational telescope, a gravitational lens, okay, um, which hasn't been done, but it's a prediction, and you'd expect to see um, in the center of this galaxy um, stars being, images being distorted by, by gravity and then finally a black hole. And, and the simulation says that, well, here are these lines of force, we get lines of force, um, and they're being wound, wound up, as you see in this picture, and then the result is all this energy comes out um, and here's uh, the sort of thing that we think happens. Here's this jet of energy coming out, and it runs into surrounding clouds and then gives you a big uh, bubble, basically, of, of released energy. So this is the sort of thing we observe and tells us that this is what's happening. So I'll show you, finally, some, some beautiful images of what astronomers measure now, with, mostly with radio telescopes, to see these jets and things. Um, and so this is why we're so confident that only something like a really massive black hole weighing millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions times that of the sun uh, must be present. No, nothing else can power these things. So in the center of this galaxy, which we can't observe that well, but we do see all the, the byproducts, this radio image, you see big a jet and then big balloons of plasma as the, as the whole stuff heats up and runs into a cloud. And again, this is an actual jet and again, running into clouds, and then all this is really hot plasma full of cosmic rays. The cosmic rays that we, similar to those that we observe with, with our telescopes on the Earth, the X rays, the gamma rays, etc., come from these things. And so these are, this is the process at work. Obviously, these are so complicated details that we're just beginning to understand them, mm -hmm. but we can see this happening in the universe. One of the most spectacular events is this one, Hercules in a constellation called Hercules, it's a very bright radio source, you can see a whole series of events occurred, right? So these are successive explosions, um, which were going more or less the same direction and giving you this big bubbles of very, very shock-heated plasma as the stuff balloons out when it runs into some, some cloud. And that stops the, uh, uh, the jet continuing. Okay, so um, it's... Uh, quite, all, all this is... I, I find this, you know mind-boggling, really, that we can observe these things, and, and, and yet um, uh, we still are struggling to come to grips with the theory. So here again, here's a galaxy, host galaxy. In the center, there's a massive black hole. It's giving you this very narrow jet, but incredibly high energy, 
coming from this wound up magnetic field in the very centre near the black hole, that's what gives you the energy source, that it runs into a cloud and gives you this, um, these huge bl balloons, basically, uh, bubbles, bubbles, really, bubbles of very hot, hot X-ray emitting plasma and radio emitting plasma too. So you see um, radio emission from all of this stuff, tet, um, which is the way you monitor these things. And just to give you the scale, this is roughly the size of the Milky Way, and this is sort of 10 times larger. So we're, we're talking, um, you know, l l large phenomena. So the nearest galaxy, big galaxy to us, is one of the strongest radio so sources in um, the Virgo cluster of galaxies. We call it Messier 87. And um, it is the best studied of these phenomena because it's really close to us. It's just, um, you know, some tens of millions of light years away, 20 million light years away from us, which may seem not much, but it's closer than most of the others. And, and in, and in this, this system, we can actually watch, we have the resolution to, to, to study in detail um, the phenomena that comes out from the centre. And so you can see all these very... And then, again, there are successive explosions which uh, give rise to all of this hot plasma coming from the centre of this galaxy. <coughs> OK, and uh, this, this is a, a beautiful image of, of the jet. Okay, So in the centre, again... Um, well, this is one of the most massive black holes that we've ever measured, four billion times the mass of the sun. It's inferred to be from the motions of stars around it. This is roughly uh, uh, the size of this very large galaxy. In the centre, it's glowing, and um, um, you have this jet coming out from, because of me, there are very many stars there, but you see this jet coming out from the centre, produced by the central black hole, and um, running into clouds, giving you blobs of intense emission. And there have been several events that create these different blobs over time. And what is interesting is because you just see this on one side, there is a weaker one on the other side, hard to see because of the orientation of this picture. But that's uh, the way that's brought to go. OK, so that's for jets. Um, let me just tell you finally about winds. Um, th this is um, another sort of dr dramatic um, part of the whole picture. Um, so here we have, again, a galaxy, uh, one that um, is probably a result of merging with another galaxy. But in any case, it's, it's, there, there are huge outflows coming from this central galaxy. And you, th these are shock waves, OK? So the outflows are running into surrounding material. And so what we think is going on is that this galaxy is shedding all sorts of debris into the nearby intergalactic medium and mixing things up. So the same thing that happens in our Milky Way, we have exploding stars, we think also happens on much larger scales. And maybe this is the, the best example of this. So this is um, a nearby galaxy which has had a massive explosion. So, and so, it, so here is the galaxy, you're looking at it edge on. Um, these are all stars, the wider stuff. And, uh, the, um, and then you see uh, all this debris. This is reflected off dust grains, actually. And this is a gigantic explosion. So we call this a wind. And the, the gas is just coming out at enormous velocity, leaving the galaxy and polluting the entire medium, intergalactic medium around it. So this happens on the scale of our Milky Way when stars explode. It also happens on much larger scales. So when we try to piece together how the universe really evolved, chemically speaking, you can't just start, you know, stop at our own galaxy. You have to think of its surroundings, how our galaxy got to where it is. We probably have been polluted by other galaxies as well as um, are in the process of polluting our own galaxies. Pollu polluting in the sense of chemically polluting something essential for life to exist. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. OK, and my final example um, is going to be um, clusters of galaxies. So these are... Uh, uh, now, thousand galaxies in a cluster. Okay, and I want to show you just one example, which is one of the most um, beautiful clusters in the sky, because um, it's actually a, a merger of two clusters. And so this is a combined image of where you have an, it's an X-ray image and at the same time an optical image, but optical in the sense of looking at dark matter, which I'll try to explain. So first of all, um, uh, there are these. But there's all this hot gas, okay, enormous, and we're discussing now millions of light years across, okay. So these, what we think is happening is we have um, two clusters of galaxies, you might think there's four, merging together. But so what is weird about this is that all the red is dark matter and all this is hot gas. So a cluster of galaxies typically, you know, is a big cloud of stars, galaxies, a lot of dark matter and a lot of hot gas. It should all be in one place. But in this case, everything is separated because we think there are two clusters merging together. 
And when they merge together, the dark matter bits of the cluster, um, dark matter is something that we think is something really weakly interacting. It's like, um, you know, two ghosts running through each other. Um, and so the dark matter stays, um, you know, doesn't get, um, you know, where, where, where's the, where's the X-ray stuff actually um, does end up in a different place from the dark matter. And so how do we know this is dark matter? Well, what, what you do is you look for the, the, the distortions um, by gravity of the galaxy images. So buried inside where this red stuff came from is a detailed analysis of the shapes of all of these galaxies. And you learn that um, only in these regions are the shapes distorted by the effect of what we call gravitational lensing. Einstein's theory saying that matter bends light basically tells us where the matter is. So here we suddenly can see now, um, uh, thanks to uh, the X-ray universe and combining with the optical universe with telescopes, uh, that life can be really complicated and that dark matter and gas can do you know, remarkably different things when um, large-scale structure develops. So that's a, a, a very large-scale phenomenon. And here's another example, another cluster of galaxies. Again, this is purely an X-ray image with, with the Chandra telescope, which has the same resolution as the best optical telescope, so half a second of arc. And so uh, unlike... Um, so when you look at this one in X-rays, you don't see anything uniform. The X-rays are all mixed up because in the center there's a galaxy and this galaxy has had a whole series of explosions. And there may have been jets and just and winds, a combination of everything. And, and as you look further out, you can see older and older explosions, the debris from older explosions. So life, in, and this is again a million, a million light years across from there to there. So on all scales, we're seeing this amazing properties of the high energy universe. If you looked at this optically, all you'd see would be a cloud of galaxies, you know, thousands of galaxies, nothing special about them. But in the X-rays, it's incredibly complex. And what we're realizing with our studies is that the amount of mass in, in all this gas that we see is more than there is in the stars. This is a dominant part of the entire system, all this hot X-ray emitting gas. That's where most of the mass is, apart from the dark mass, which is much harder to find. I showed you an example of that before. OK, so um, finally, um, the message I want to give you is that the universe looks incredibly different when you look at it at different, um, with different types of telescopes, at different types of energy. Um, so, you know, here we have a conventional optical image of um, a beautiful image of a, of a star-forming galaxy. Um, but when you look at the galaxies um, in, the, um, in the gamma rays or the infrared or, or the X-rays um, or the cosmic rays, um, to the extent we can make an image at all, things are just totally different. So here, for example, I showed you, these are neutrino signals. We have so few neutrinos, we can't possibly get images of galaxies so far. One day, that, that may all change, but these are just individual events, totally different from the events that give you, you know, each pixel is a photon, basically, on this beautiful CCD image. But these are just something bizarre, and we don't even know the source of, the, of these events. And then um, as you go through um, the exploding stars, here are some of the um, amazing things. Remember the, the crab, uh, the pulsar, the spinning pulsar, and the old remnants. One is 10,000 years old, others are uh, a few hundred years old. And then, so that's the stellar scale of things. And then when we moved on to the uh, larger scale, um, we began looking at, uh, at galaxies and the amazing jets that we saw. Um, the galaxy itself, remember, is just in the center uh, over here. And these enormous explosions of, uh, here's the galaxy. You can see that this is an optical image superimposed on the radio. Here's the galaxy. And these explosions just uh, light up the outside parts of the galaxy. Uh, and then finally, the whole mystery of um, the damage, the black hole. This is, a, this is a simulation. We haven't seen this yet. Someday we may get pictures like this. But this mysterious black hole is in the middle and it is responsible for... for um, a lot of this damage. So I hope you've got some appreciation for um, the, uh, the high energy universe. Um, thank you.